Purple Daily is daily Vikings entertainment. We just want the Vikings to win a Super Bowl before we die. I will ride with this group. Seriously, man. Please. And away we go. Man, what a time to be alive. Just bonus episodes of Purple Daily left and right here. We got the Write That Down predictions coming up today, but I want to ask you guys about Kevin O'Connell's little media tour the last couple days. He went on the Pat McAfee show specifically, and he might have tipped his hand. That was funny, huh? Mm-hmm. He might have tipped well, his hand mm-hmm. with a couple couple mm-hmm. comments. Mm-hmm. His coach's br- uh, breakfast thing went, what, 35 mi- minutes of uh, of questions from... Various people, including our old friend Chris Thomason. Saw that Thomason I saw made, the a, CT. made a cameo. They sort of hugged it hug. out. Yeah. Well, they can't, he, did, he gave the awkward side. Well, he said, I've hug. hugged you twice already, so yeah. I'm not going to hug yeah. you anymore. And But but then he said, awkward. I'll give you a hug. And he gave the awkward side hug. And <laughs> Seifert was sitting right there, clearly very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Yeah. Very <laughs> uncomfortable. But not as uncomfortable as when O'Connell, who I think ha- has a cold, let loose with a back-to-back sneeze. Oh, that's the worst, said, man. Sorry, Kevin, I might have gotten you there. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Dude, that happened. Not a, well, Maybe it was a sneeze. I'm trying to remember what it was. But when I worked at Play It Again Sports as a skate sharpener when I was in high school. Oh, nice. oh this is. Yeah, he and, told this one. Uh, this is yeah, the guy, who, the guy who ran the, the joint okay. was showing me how to. It was like my second week on the job or something. He's showing sure. me the skate sharpener machine. And he was an old Big Ten baseball player from the 1980s. So he put the big... Puts oh, a big God. dip in his bomb lip. You know? Oh, boy. And he's uh, so, yeah, he's, yeah, get, yeah, get in there. He's like, show me. He's like looking over. And as he says something, a giant chunk of chew. I could oh. see it in slow motion. Flies out of his mouth and lands <laughs> right on my bare skinned arm. Oh, man. And I'm looking just terrified. Like, ah, oh, this, this wet glob is sitting on my bare oh, skin. That's... And he goes, oh, did I get you? <laughs> and he leans over and he flicks it off my arm. Oh, oh, oh! I'm not sure what's oh, worse. Sorry. Did I get you? Did I'm not sure what's there? worse, that or or the threat of a person who's already sick spraying germs. Like both of those are very close because yours is more disgusting. Your story is yeah. more disgusting. But if you're not sick, I think I take the chew spit on the hand. On the hand. On the yeah, hand. well, right, right. Can, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, can it, you can wash it off. Yeah. I agree with that completely. But I mean, so. yeah, you hate to be by a guy who's who's got the cold, and then he's like, "Oh, sorry, sorry if I got you." Yeah, yeah. Maybe if uh, some chew comes out of your mouth or you sneeze all over the place, maybe you can call Zero Res and deep clean your home. Spring mm-hmm. cleaning season. It's also like spring allergy sickness season. Just deep cleaning everything is a good call, and that's where Zero Res comes in with a four point nine rating on Google, seventeen thousand reviews. Call Zero Res today. And ask for the Score North special. You get three rooms, zero resified, starting at just $129. And this month, take $75 off when you get those air ducts, zero res clean. 9520res or zeroresminnesota.com. Say you want the Score North special. Spell it forward or backwards. It spells the same. Zero res. Okay. So KOC, a couple things. So on the Pat McAfee show... McAfee was, you know how he does, he'll, he'll push guys. It's all yeah. kind of fun, but he'll like ask very pointed questions to put people on the spot. And at one point he goes, oh, so Michael Penix? Penix? Right. And yeah, KOC kind of just like deer in the headlights pauses. Mm-hmm. And he's like, uh, no, just like all the quarterbacks. We like the quarterbacks. We like accuracy. Um, and then uh, at one point he was asked about JJ, JJ to JJ. Is there enough room in there for two JJs? And KOC said diplomatically, you got you to get to our new practice facility. There's room for a lot of JJs oh, wow. in our practice facility. Yeah, it was great. So they were having some fun. But he said one thing very specifically that I think may have tipped his hand. And by the way, like with, with Mark Wilf doing the media tour and KOC, not that they would have to, but like they're not making it a secret. They are going to pick a quarterback, right? Like, all the it's, they're not even they're not even out there being like you know we they're saying we feel good about Sam Darnold but they're also talking about all these other quarterbacks. They're coming so. as close as they're coming as close as an executive in this league does to yep. basically telegraphing their move. Yep, they're not. Um, yeah, they're not being too shy about it. So KOC was asked, "What is the most important trait in a quarterback in your mind?" And he listed a couple different things like football intelligence and leadership skills and mentally physically tough. But he doubled down on one thing specifically. He said, quote, 
accuracy is the most important trait in a quarterback. So I did some digging on pro football focus. I was curious who in college football were the most among the quarterbacks that are likely to be drafted. Mm -hmm. Who are the most accurate throwers of the football? Not just completion percentage, because that can be deceiving, but actual accuracy rate. And even if you start to look at like depth of target, which is an important right. thing, driving like the ball. Where down are the you field. accurate? Absolutely. Yep. So of all the quarterbacks in Division One college football, whatever, like 150 or 160 qualified quarterbacks in Division One football, the sixth most accurate quarterback was Jaden Daniels, 79% accuracy rate. The fifth most accurate quarterback was J.J. McCarthy, 80% accuracy rate. The most accurate quarterback in the country with an 85% accuracy rate was Bo Nix. Mm -hmm. Now there's a there's an asterisk next to it in that Bo Nix averaged six yards depth of throw, like six and a half yards in the air depth of throw, a lot of shorter throws. Right. McCarthy and Daniels averaged 10 plus yards average depth of target. Right. So if if now again, like can they lead? Are they good teammates? Are they not weirdos? Can they process all those things? But in terms of a physical trait, something you can do with the football in your hand, if accuracy is the number one most important factor for Kevin O'Connell, Bo Nix is interesting because he is the most accurate quarterback. He can make those short intermediate throws. So that's why I keep kind of putting him in the conversation. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking for guys that can chunk it down the field, intermediate and also deep, and the Vikings live in that intermediate range, right? The fact that Jaden Daniels and J.J. McCarthy are both fifth and sixth in the country last year with an average depth of target of 10-plus yards, almost double Bo Nix, those are the two guys that instantly stood out to me when I heard Kevin O'Connell say that. J.J. McCarthy, Jaden Daniels, and then, like, Bo Nix off to the side over here. So I, I went, and when I saw the prep note for today, I went and did some digging here and our friends from the 33rd team which involves a bunch of ex-executives including Spielman Zimmer was in involved a bunch of quarterback guys they do accuracy rankings from one to nine and this is like a scouting grade and like this a... is a scouting grade yes yeah. so this is not like a national grade Drake May fits the profile the best Caleb Caleb Williams is the ideal but he's gone mm -hmm. he scores an eight in overall accuracy which is excellent Short accuracy, deep accuracy. He's an eight across the board, so he's the best. But he's gone. Drake May, who you who who, if you make the right trade, and there there is a ESPN mock today that has the Vikings trading up to the third pick. Goodbye, 2025 first round pick. But that's we'll get to that one. We'll get to another discussion. Uh, Drake May is a six across the board overall accuracy, short and deep. 100, 122 passes thrown of 15 plus yards last year. He was on target of those passes, so 15-plus yards, 52.5% of the time, but the ball was catchable, graded out to a 67.5%. On Bo Nix, I... Oh, that's I, a lot of numbers. Football. No, I hit you with the football center. On Bo Nix, I wanted to look, because I've, I've been far hard, harder on Bo Nix than you guys. I wanted to look and see if there was something there. And I came away from this believing he he was even more of a tricked up car than i believed first of all his completion percentage at auburn was 59.5 so it was not good in college compared to what compared to the fact that in 2023 it was 77 percent, which jumps off the page absolutely are we real quick are we so he struggled at auburn in a more yep. I guess you could say pro style or, or an, an offense that would ask him to do more things that are relating to what you do in the NFL, right? Correct, correct. And then he goes to Oregon, and it's much more tricked up, and it's short accuracy, boom, 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 right? Mm -hmm. But are we? I guess my my poke back is as a so as a twenty year old or a nineteen year old or whatever, let's call him a twenty year old at Auburn. He kind of struggled. Are we just? That's just the story on him then. Okay, so he struggled when he was twenty at Auburn being asked to do some things that were over his head. Like I just, I struggle with just dis okay. Dismissing him because he struggled at Auburn, I guess. Which is why I looked at what they asked him to do. So, so my question was, was there progression within the confines of what you might be asked to do or, or did a smart coaching staff say, Hey, you've got skills. 
we're going to bring them out, but we're going to do it in a very college way, which of course won't be applicable now. RPOs, checkdowns, his second progression was almost always a checkdown. Mm-hmm. So that's where the that's why his pass completion or depth of target was so short. Yep. There's just too many things. He was also pressured at Oregon last year, 16% of the time, which was the least amount in the country. So they basically said, get rid of the ball. Yep. And now it's so this is good. Let's keep let's keep going back and forth on some of this because like this information all leads to a story. Mm-hmm. Now the story can't be complete until they spend it sounds like potentially multiple days with at least J.J. McCarthy because Kevin O'Connell said over the next several days or over the, over the coming days, they're going to spend time with J.J. McCarthy. Correct. So they might be getting multiple days with him. But like being in the room, you really get a feel for whether a guy is full of crap or not, right? And you can look at more of his film and stuff. But so on on let's let's go back to the deep throws because you brought up one of the stats you brought up was like 15 yards or more in the air for Drake May. Can you throw that one out there again? The Drake May one, 15 yards in the air. Yep, uh, on target, 52.5 percent of the time. But then on film, when, when you went back and looked at the passes that got caught and didn't, so this is probably the more impressive statistic. Mm-hmm. 67.5 percent of the time, the ball of 15 plus yards on 122 passes was catchable. So 68% of the time. So here's another feather in the cap of Drake May, but also Jaden Daniels and J.J. McCarthy. And and it's possible that all of this is just saying that, hey, maybe J.J. McCarthy does belong in the conversation with some of these other guys. Mm -hmm. So on deep passes that travel 20 or more yards in the air, Jaden Daniels had a 99 out of 100 PFF grade, 22 touchdowns, no interceptions, 27 what are called big-time throws. J.J. McCarthy had a 93 PFF grade. Drake May had a 97 PFF grade on 20-plus yard throws. And 33 big-time throws as classified by Pro Football Focus. So it's kind of now Jaden Daniels is playing with more NFL talent than Drake May, and you have to account for some of that when you're watching. But I kind of like that about Drake May, that he he didn't sit there with a bunch of future NFL pro bowlers around him. Right. He's trailing in a lot of games or playing in close games. Like he's in a, a dog fight with the Gophers, you know, like I think some people they'll look at a quarterback's record in college and be like, Oh, like how did, how did his team lose to these teams? Well, because he's not playing with two NFL wide receivers and an NFL left tackle and an NFL defense. Right? No. So if, if your life is a little harder in college in that way, I think there's, there's something to be said for maybe it prepares you better for the NFL. So the 33rd team um, uh, scouting report figures on McCarthy are intriguing as well. Overall a- accuracy, they consider him to be sufficient, which is a five out, out of the nine. Short accuracy, he's considered to be good, six out of the nine. Deep accuracy, he goes back to a five for sufficient. And what's interesting about that, and and I think this is one of the main things there, because in this league, it's incredibly important. You know, his throw on deeper balls at Michigan were perimeter balls where he struggled. Like you've seen those throws that, that went out, out of bounds Mm -hmm. that went. And now in college, you can recover from that. But in the pros, like those, as Brad Childress used to say, you can only have so many long foul balls. Uh, You might only get like three cracks in a game. You got to hit one. Foul balls are used. So, so like those aren't recoverable necessarily. So I think in vetting McCarthy, one thing that becomes incredibly important is his ability to work to to the perimeter, because obviously when you have Jefferson and Addison and this group, the Mm -hmm. perimeter is going to have to be worked to at times. I thought that I thought that among the deficiencies with McCarthy was a great talking point, because that's something that a guy like O'Connell is not going to dismiss. That's going to be important in the thought process on J.J. McCarthy. There is some some steam out there that McCarthy has been tweaking his mechanics over the last few weeks, too, because especially throwing to the left side of the field, there's some, like, if, he, if I, I don't, I'm not going to get in the weeds on, like, quarterback mechanics, but that the way that he is stepping or the way that he is turning his shoulders or whatever is leading to some foul balls that, you know, that should be turned into hits in the NFL. Mm-hmm. So let okay. A couple more categories here as we comb through. This is fun. This is a a, a little deep dive into because Kevin O'Connell has kind of opened up 
here are the things that I put value into. Well, performing under duress, whether you're pressured or blitzed, is another huge one, especially with the uncertainty of the interior of this offensive line. Yes. You don't know who your center is going to be beyond 2024. Right now, you don't really have a left guard. It might be Blake Brandle. Uh, Ed Ingram is a giant question mark at right and, guard. And D lines are just really good. Yeah, even if you have a great offensive line, yeah. you're, you're going to have to deal with pressure 20 to 30% of the time in the NFL. So you mentioned Bo Nix was only pressured like 15 or 16% of dropbacks. Right. But here's the interesting thing on PFF. The highest PFF grades when pressured, number one, Bo Nix. Now, again, he was pressured a lot less. Right. Did the system have a bunch of built-in answers? But, you know, like Kevin O'Connell's system has built-in. Like every good offensive system should have built-in answers when you're faced with pressure. Jaden Daniels was second in PFF grade when pressured. He also has the ability to just scoot out of the pocket and run for a thousand yards. Yes. JJ McCarthy was sixth when pressured. The other guys, by the way, aren't like train wrecks, Caleb Williams and Michael Penix and Drake may like they're all within the top 15 or 20, but those were the top three mm. when pressured yards per attempt. When pressured, Jaden Daniels first Bo Nix fifth, JJ McCarthy was seventh. When blitzed, Jaden Daniels, number one PFF grade. Bo Nix, number four. Like, Bo Nix keeps popping up. I see why, like, people are in, some people are intrigued by him because he keeps popping up accuracy versus pressure versus the blitz. But how much of that is just tricked up and built in and almost anyone could have had this level of performance that, you know, had enough talent? Um, I'll give you one more here for now. This is another category that I think is really important in the NFL, sack avoidance. So especially here covering the Vikings and talking about the Vikings, we as media and fans in Minneapolis, or if you're a Vikings fan around the country, I think we fall into the trap all too often of pinning sacks or sack avoidance on the offensive line mostly, where, okay, Kirk Cousins got sacked four times in that game. Sure. Blame the offensive line for all four of them, right? Or uh, boy, look at the look at the protection. Like, he hasn't taken a sack in five weeks. And yes, the offensive line does influence pressures and does influence sacks to some extent. But the best quarterbacks in the league, going back decades, are great at avoiding sacks. Go mm -hmm. go back and look at like Peyton Manning, one of the least mobile quarterbacks in the history of the NFL. Go look at Peyton Manning from 2008, 2009. He's being sacked like 12 or 15 times in a full season. And yeah, he has Jeff Saturday. He has a pretty good offensive Charles line. Charles Johnson was his left tackle for a year, and Charles Johnson was awful. Yep. Peyton Manning was great at getting rid of the ball. Tom Brady was yep. great at getting rid of the ball. Okay. Yep. So a, a good NFL sack rate, the best quarterbacks in the league are getting sacked like five or six percent of the time. Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes were the best sack rate quarterbacks in terms of lowest sack rate, sack avoidance. Yep. Jordan Love was in the top five, Jared Goff, Tua, Kirk was fifth or sixth. Yep. Kirk has become really good at avoiding sacks. The number one sack avoiding quarterback in all of college football by a country mile is Michael Penix. He gets sacked on 2% of dropbacks in college. Joe Burrow, for instance, was sacked 7% of the time on that great LSU team that was maybe the best college football team in the history of mm -hmm. the sport. Mm -hmm. So Penix is taking taking two percent sacks in his six year college career, and so so that's another thing. Like that shows high football IQ. It shows being able to get rid of the ball. It shows being able to go through your progressions quickly, keeping your eyes down the field. Right. So I don't know. Like I think going back to yesterday's episode, there's just to me there's a lot of things to like about six different quarterbacks here, and you have to figure out. How, what, what's the gap between the different tiers of these guys? Because we just went through a bunch of stuff here. Obviously, Jaden Daniels and Drake May are the big play, like highest upside players, but there's also a lot of great underlying trends with Bo Nix and with Michael Penix. So this is all good news for the Vikings in that there's just a lot of options to find your quarterback of the future. I'm at five, guys, because I uh, Pe Penix I like. Penix, I think, is purely, and I understand it, injury risk, and I don't mm -hmm. care. Yes, his combine... Physical went great, or supposedly it did. Who, who knows? But um, but the problem there is he's had enough problems where if he drops back, I, I mean, hell, we we went through it here unexpectedly. 
Bridgewater dropped back, collapsed, and basically didn't play again here. Yeah. So, so like that's the thing is if that if that bites you in the ass, that's a problem. But as far as a player goes, Penix is good. Penix is a I I trust more what I've seen there, and I trust that Washington didn't nearly as much do a college trick up. So I I, I actually think he a improved yeah. and b you know for instance he has a really good arm. He throws a great deep ball. Like he does a lot of the things that 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 if I'm O'Connell, at least intrigue me for sure. Um, if I look at this though, so so let's theoretically say, because we almost know for certain, Caleb Williams goes to Chicago. Okay, Jaden Daniels, who I think is probably the guy that I would take next. L- let's j- just say that for now, mm-hmm. the Commanders hold on to, to their pick, and he goes. So now it comes down to if you can get the third pick from the Patriots, McCarthy or May. The more I look at this, Drake May fits what O'Connell wants the most. Mm-hmm. And think about the the best version of Drake May feels like Josh Allen, big, right. tall, athletic. Right. You probably hard to actually. Bring down. You probably actually are going to have to get him to run or scramble a little bit less than than he would by at the start, just because things will slow down. But yeah, I feel I feel like if you look at Drake May, one prototypically for sure, but two as far as like if O'Connell can fi- can fit a quarterback piece into a puzzle, mm-hmm. Drake May probably fits. Drake May might fit O'Connell's vision m- more than Jaden Daniels, but if Jaden Daniels was there. I think the overall possibilities would be too great to pass up. You would adapt if needed. Yep. There's a video going around somewhere on social media. I can't remember who posted it, but it's like a five minute cut up of Drake May's long throws down the field, his 20 plus yard throws. Yep. It's like 30 of these throws. And again, he's throwing to North Carolina personnel here. He's not throwing to Malik yeah. neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. The gopher game. He threw a couple of beautiful Dude, deep balls. Like that, those are he was rolling great. out to the right off like one leg and yeah. threw a forty yard dart to the end zone. Yep. But it's crazy. He's accurate on like twenty seven of the thirty or whatever it was, twenty five of the twenty eight deep passes traveling twenty yards or more. So and also just going back to the to the deep throw stat that I brought up earlier, thirty three big time throws, meaning fifty fifty tight window or you know. T- like red zone touchdown type, however they classify uh, in their formula. He's, he's got that Josh Allen and you might have to coach a little bit out of him. Cause he's, he's very willing to just sling it right. and make a, I'd, but I'd rather have a guy that has that in him than a guy that is just sort of a nervous check down, well, nervous Nelly eyes are looking at the offensive line. Like give me a guy that's going to be willing to throw Brett Favre, Josh Allen gunslinger type throws. And it, it's why scouting college is so tough at times too, because like these coaches, coaches in college aren't hired to train guys to be pros. They, they are, you know, the reason why they're hired is to win football games, right? Yeah. So like that's where you've got to sort of dissect the film. And I think Drake may, like I think what you see on his film is a lot of of Sunday attributes, and that's the you know that's the question. Yeah. And it's, it's and. True. If you could throw deep, that's awesome, and that's good. But again, across the board, like there's so many variables here, um, of of you know, especially like the Vikings. I yep. mean, Justin Jefferson. It's not like his average depth of target every time is 20 yards. You know, there's some crossing routes. There's some things like that. Mm-hmm. Can you throw on time? Can you make anticipatory throws? Because in this league, if you can't, you're probably screwed. But that's why I think Drake may like of where the Vikings could fall because I don't think they're going to get to second. I think the Drake may one would probably be their dream scenario. The more I examine this e- even more than McCarthy, I don't think they'd complain about McCarthy, but like Drake may has a lot of those attributes built in that I think O'Connell thinks, Oh hell yeah. I, I could build off those assuming the personality fits. And that's a whole different question and that we can't know. Yeah. Yeah. That yep. that's the only thing that we, you know, we can't find a PFF stat, obviously. I don't, we can't find a statistic on it, but I go back to what he said the other day on Monday, which is like when he walks in the room, he, he changes the room, right? He changes the attitude. He changes the perception. You feel that presence, which just some people have and some people don't have. And you could be as, you know, talented Raleigh, like 
Bo Nix and every basically college quarterback. Like you're one of the, you know, 50 best quarterbacks in the world or so. But what do you feel like when you walk into a room and what is the what is the feeling like around him? And that's the one area we can watch all the tape and all the football nerds can break down the tape. But I think those behind the scene conversations, which we'll never really get access to, those are going to be the defining things of what probably separates a few of these guys. But didn't you guys love the, the fact that, that like O'Connell explained that in detail? Mm-hmm. Because he called them building changing QBs. I love that. Like, like that's the thing is, do you get that? And I know that, you know, everybody wants their players to be alphas, right? Like everybody wants that. But can you define it? And O'Connell did. I, I'll go back to, and I, I know O'Connell jokes about his career because it was not long and successful but i'll go back to everything that we discussed yesterday that he learned from that and as you said phil i mean you're in the same quarterback room as brady yeah like like everything and and o'connell strikes me i don't think this is breaking news as a complete sponge like he strikes me as a guy and there's a lot of coaches or or guys that basically quarterbacks who things deflect off of them and so you're like, hold on a second. You were in the room with this guy and you didn't learn a damn thing. O'Connell to me, the yeah. polar opposite. I think he learned, I think he absorbed everything. Agreed. I agree. I have one more thing on this, just in terms of what does Kevin O'Connell want in a quarterback? This is really interesting. So we've spent some time talking about deep passes and, but if you look, there was, there was 40 qualified quarterbacks that, that played at least 20% of their team snaps last year. The Vikings had three of them because Kirk played a half season. Then Dobbs played enough to qualify um, with his two stops. And then Nick Mullins qualified too. So stick with me on this. In terms of percentage of pass attempts that travel deep, 20 yards or more, Kirk Cousins was 39th out of 40. So he had he had the second lowest percentage of deep pass attempts of any quarterback in the NFL last year. Josh Dobbs was 27th. That also includes some Cardinals stuff, so it's a little noisy. Sure. But the second most frequent deep passer in the NFL was Nick Mullins. Nick <laughs> Mullins Nick Mullins <laughs> threw twice as many deep passes percentage-wise. I buy it. Compared to Kirk Cousins. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So which one of those guys, those are two extremes. Nick Mullins is second in percentage of deep throws. Kirk Cousins is second to last. Right. Operating the same system in the same year. Right. With the same head coach. But Which one of them is doing it the way that Kevin O'Connell, is it possible that Nick Mullins is like, whatever you want, coach, whatever you want, coach. Yeah, I'll throw the ball on the field. Is this actually a deep passing offense that Kirk really didn't feel comfortable taking it to that extent? And Nick Mullins is like, hell yeah, dude, yeah, let's but, go. But the problem with Nick is he's like a bad Favre because he's <laughs> like, you think Brett Favre was foolish with the football? Watch this pass. I think it's, uh, I think it's very much in the middle. That's what I think. Yeah. Like, like did, did Kirk take as many chances as O'Connell wanted? Probably not. Like that, that goes back to his whole conversation about, you know, balls that I don't advise and passes that I do advise. And I mean, Kirk, at the end of the day, Kirk was going to be Kirk. Kirk was going to be, I mean, the man checked down the ball on fourth and eight with the season on the line for three yards. Um, but I mean, M- Mullins at times was absolutely like, like, uh, l- like Kirk drunk. I'll just throw the ball here. I'll throw the ball there. I think it is. Hell yeah. I, I think what O'Connell wants is something that's not, that's probably a little bit more aggressive at times than Kirk. But not nearly as, how can I put this nicely, destructive as Nick was. Yeah. So I, don't know, I thought thought that was interesting. But yeah, really so Kevin Kevin O'Connell opening up about just the different things that he likes, accuracy being really important. But we also know that he wants his quarterbacks to be driving the ball down the field. So I think I guess my biggest takeaway from all of this is is twofold. Number one, JJ McCarthy in some of the statistical comparisons actually does profile closer to the Jaden Daniels, Drake May level when you look at some of these numbers we went out. And Bo Nix actually pops a lot in some of these categories too, but how much of it is just a guy that's being propped up? And that's what that's what the Vikings had to figure out. And he really wouldn't be an option unless the draft goes horribly at the top right, and right. they find themselves kind of boxed out and now they have to make a decision on, well, crap. Is is there a plan B here at 11 as we, as we survey that part of the draft. Absolutely. Yeah. So as I said, I think the two guys, 
I think they'd be very happy with May and McCarthy would not be a, a bad choice. I mean, Jaden Daniels is probably the best choice possible, but I just don't think, I, I mean, unless, unless Pelissero is right and Washington moves off if, off of him or something crazy takes place, I got to think he's gone second. Yeah. So buckle up. Four more weeks. Four more weeks of speculation. Declan's going to pull all of his hair out in the next four weeks because he just wants an answer right now. Mm-hmm. But uh, we're going to have to be patient here. Declan ain't pulling his hair out. He, That's he true. might do he a lot of things. That guy would it. never pull his hair I got it naturally. Or, you know, I got it very groomly pulled, pulled out on Monday. Yeah. But, uh, groomly? Yeah. Groomly yeah. pulled out? Look at that. You got I don't the know. Nice... I was trying to find, like, the best way to say pulled out, and then I was thinking it was – there was – you could understand the boy? you could understand the predicament boy? that was in my head there. Groomly, dude. We might have just invented a new business Groomly. right there. Groomly, Groomly. the Groomly app. Check it out. The Groomly app. Hey, if you're a business owner, you know, maybe Groomly is your business out there. You should have a game plan in place to stay focused on <laughs> safety and preventing claims. Let the team at Federated Mutual Insurance Company help and support your business. Federated offers a customizable lineup of industry-specific coverages and risk management services to help you continue your winning streak as a great business owner. At Federated, it's our business to protect yours. You can find out more at federatedinsurance.com. All right, boys, we got another episode coming up today too. Write that down Wednesday, an accountability session. And uh, and I think we're going to squeeze in the latest round of NFL win totals. Some disrespect for your purple 